Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the sixth episode of our monthly four flight workshop webinar series. And before we get started tonight, just a couple quick little housekeeping items tonight that I would like to uh, introduce. Uh, first of all, my name is Mike Jesh. I am a flight instructor based in the Southern California area. I fly a Cessna 182 based out of Fullerton, California. Uh, if you are joining us here for the first time tonight, if you have not seen any of the earlier episodes, uh, this is number six, we've got five priors. We build on the previous content from previous episodes. So if you haven't watched those, uh, you get a lot more out of this one if you went back and watched the previous ones and we'll wait for you to, to take care of that and come back here and we'll be back in about uh, four or five hours. Uh, but um, seriously, folks, uh, no, I, the, the earlier, uh, programs are good to have watched, but it's not a showstopper. You'll still get a lot of stuff out of tonight, even if you have, haven't watched the previous stuff. Uh, with regard to Wings credit tonight, again, a reminder that if you are watching tonight, it's October 2nd, uh, 2023, in the evening time here, depending on your time zone. If you're watching tonight, your Wings credit will be granted automatically. There is nothing that you have to do, and you'll see those credits in your uh, email box or your faasafety.gov account in a few days. Give Brian uh, a week or so. If you haven't seen your credit pop up in the next week, then you might consider poking him and uh, poking us and make sure that you've got the credit. If you're watching it live on, or watching a recording rather on socialflight.com, uh, that credit will be granted through a process that happens on the, I believe it's a quiz that's going to be administered after you finish the program. Uh, Brian will correct me on that if I'm wrong. And if you're watching on YouTube, there will be a quiz uh, for sure at the end of that one. Uh, there will be a uh, link in one of the description comments underneath the uh, video on YouTube. So that's how you'll be getting your wings credit for that. Uh, for tonight's program, I see a lot of people already active in both the chat and the Q&A. Please keep in mind that we're not going to be able to keep up with all the chatter going on in the chat room. So uh, if you have an actual question that you would like the team here to try to address tonight, please use the Q&A. Uh, please don't put comments on there. We're just going to dismiss those and get right on to the real uh, questions. Uh, but put your questions in there. If it's something germane to the subject matter tonight, then we'll go ahead and answer it online. We'll either have Brian or one of the team here will answer it or we'll type an answer to you uh, for it. If it's something that maybe we answered in a previous episode or if we have a quick reference for you. Um, while I'm speaking about the chat, I know a lot of folks watching on a, an iPad, if you're watching via Zoom on an iPad, there's a lot of distraction that comes from the chat feature. Uh, if down toward the bottom of the screen, there's a chat button. If you push on that, there will be a little menu that will pop up, and in the upper right corner of that is a bell, a little bell-shaped icon. If that icon is blue colored, and it's kind of hard to tell whether it's blue or black, but if it is blue, you will get an alert that pops up every time somebody posts a chat message and that can be pretty distracting so just tap that button it should turn black and the chat uh, alarms will go off if you will so that'll make things a little bit nicer for you uh, and we take all the features from all the versions of ForeFlight, all the levels of subscription and we'll talk about them all back and forth so we try to keep track of which features are in which levels of subscription and if we're talking about something that's in the performance level or the pro level we'll try to remember to point that out but if you're still using a basic level and you're not seeing the feature we're talking about just kind of sit tight for a couple of minutes. And we'll get back around to something that is available on your version. And we just do this because uh, all of us on the, the team here have the Performance Plus subscription, and it's a little bit hard to keep track of which features are in that version versus the lower ones. So just bear with us if we don't. We don't mean it to be a plug to subscribe to a higher level, but wouldn't be a bad idea, maybe. Uh, so, uh, and then in future episodes, we'll also be incorporating more on uh, IFR stuff. Some of the stuff we're going to talk about will be basic VFR stuff and advanced, uh, working up through advanced IFR stuff. Uh, so just bear with us again, if you're a VFR only pilot and we're talking about IFR stuff or vice versa, if you're an IFR pilot, you don't fly VFR anymore, eh, just kind of sit tight and we'll get back around to a subject matter that will interest you very soon. So uh, tonight's topic, uh, we're going to continue the deep dive we started last program on for flight settings and setting up your aircraft. 
Uh, in that vein, there's a few little subject areas that we're going to touch base on, and then we're going to expand that with a little uh, look into setting up uh, your aircraft as far as weight and balance goes. So let me introduce to our uh, speaker, the star of the show, Captain Brian Schiff. Why don't you come on down? Hey, Mike, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. And like you said, um, you're correct in that there will be a quiz at the end of the YouTube video. There's a link in the description. There's also a quiz at the end of the socialflight.com uh, video. If you're one who likes to rewind and pause and watch over again, feel free to go watch the YouTube videos and then just take that short quiz at the end. I know that the, the Learning Center on the Social Flight website is, is wonderful. There's a lot of great content on there, but I, I don't think there is an ability to rewind on that one. Uh, in any event, uh, I love Social Flight. I love a lot of things I've posted as uh, some of the companies that are supporting us, but they're not supporting us financially. They're just giving us giveaways. Um, uh, or there are companies that, that I've asked to post their logo and say, hey, I support you guys because I shop with you. I like to buy your products or I have a membership. And, and so that's their level of support with us. Um, I think you had another question, Mike, you were going to say I was going to clear up. Do you remember what it was? Uh, nope. <laughs> well, at least I know my microphone works. Anyway, yes, it uh, does. Does mine? I'd like to. <laughs> yes. Welcome. I know we have a lot of uh, 99s on board and, and, and special thank you to the Ventura County 99s and the International 99s for helping promote this. Uh, I know many of you probably get inundated with emails, but we're really picking up a lot of more, a lot more attendees from that. So very much thanks to the, to the 99s who will benefit from any donations we get in excess of our costs are going to be donated to them and any organizations that provide aviation education uh, uh, scholarships and the, and the sword. So we'll talk about, we'll have some giveaways from these various companies and we've got discount codes. Today we're going to give away a couple of Gold Seal lifetime memberships for either private or instrument, your choice. Uh, one year membership to NAFI, which gives you uh, a lot of great educational content, National Association of Flight Instructors, of which you don't have to be a member to, uh, to, to win. The, uh, or to, you don't have to be a flight instructor to be a member either or to benefit from it. And, and while I'm talking about NAFIA, it would uh, be my best interest to, to introduce our one of our supporters on this. One of our, our, our team is Bob Mater, uh, the chairman emeritus of uh, NAFI. And he's going to be helping us in the background. Wonder he's still been he's been flight instructing for a long time and he's been uh, still still at it, still learning and uh, teaching even more. Uh, welcome, Bob. Thanks again for your help on this. You're teaching me more than, uh, you know. Well, well that's coming from you. That's quite a compliment since. Uh... Uh, I was learning to be a CFI when you and I first met, uh, <laughs> like a week ago. Well, anyway, we never stop learning. <laughs> yeah. Stop learning. Anyway, I'm glad to be here, glad to help. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, we'd love to have any of you uh, that are here uh, become members of NAFI. You don't have to be a flight instructor. Uh, a lot of great content. We're very proud of it. And uh, there'll be a, a plug for an event coming up later this month uh, that Brian has. So I'll get out of the way and have at it, Brian. Yeah, thank you. And also uh, James McKay, who's also a uh, an expert in, in for flight, knows it probably better than all the rest of us uh, and will be helping us answer questions in the background. Really appreciate his helping on that that as well. Later on, when we get to the weight and balance after our break, Mike's going to help us set up uh, a new aircraft, show some intricacies in doing so. Um, then then uh, Bob is also going to do that because he recently acquired a uh, am I allowed to say this? publicly. <laughs> yeah. He uh, he's got a new Bonanza and a beautiful bird it is and he's setting up the uh, new setup for his aircraft and weight and balance as well. So he'll show us uh, so we'll see a couple different new weight and balances. Um, just as our disclaimer, we're not affiliated with Forflight. We do not receive anything from Forflight. We're just a bunch of people who know it pretty well, sharing our knowledge and answering questions and learning while we do so because a lot of you uh, are experts as well and posting in the comments and in the chat, helping others answer questions. So that's why I'm calling this a workshop and not a webinar, because most of you who are attending have been using this for a long time, know it arguably better than we do and can answer some questions that we can't. So it, it takes a village here and here's a village. So if, if the four of us don't know something, then certainly uh, you guys chime in and help out. And, and we're learning a lot from watching that too. Uh, I'd just like to remind you that while we'll show you some techniques and, and uh, practices, it's still incumbent upon you to follow the FARs to keep your flight as safe as possible, uh, you know, regardless of what we tell you here. Um, 
again, I mentioned before that we do accept donations. These are not for us to make money or to profit from this. It's just to cover the cost, the incredible Zoom expense and the equipment that we're using to put this on. Uh, but we enjoy doing it. So, you know, don't have to give anything. This is free. If you feel like donating, great. There's there's links to these various ways of donating on our on fourflightworkshops.com and we certainly appreciate it. And like I said, any anything in ex excess of uh, our costs will be donated. And I think we're getting pretty close to that as we're getting toward the end of the year here. So I think the, uh, the 99s and other organizations who offer scholarships can anticipate a donation from us as well. So thank you for that. Um, tonight, we're going to look at some questions and comments from previous uh, workshops. We'll look at what's new in ForeFlight. We got a new few, few, bleh, a few new features this month. Um, we'll continue our deep dive into the settings. I, I was going through settings last month, and all of a sudden I looked up and it was an hour and a half later, and I thought, wow, I'm only halfway through the settings. There's a lot. So, in any event, we're going to uh, continue that and we'll pick up our discussion also on the uh, filing codes for filing flight plans and setting that up as well. So we'll get into that as well if there's time after the wait and balance. We'll do some giveaways and then we'll answer some more questions live. We'll end our recording and hang out a little bit longer. Um, if you're here, like Mike said, you're automatically going to get wings credit. Uh, for those of you watching the recording of this, uh, there will be a QR code at the end. And of course, in the YouTube description down at the bottom, there'll be a link. And if you're watching it on socialflight.com, uh, you'll see a quiz at the end as well. So let's look at some of your questions and comments from uh, between the, now and the last seminar. Yeah, Mike, you got some? Yeah, just one little quick thing. I see a couple of people with raised hands. If you would like to ask a question, please punch that Q&A button down there at the bottom of your, for, your uh, Zoom screen and type your question in there. And uh, Brian or one of us on the team will take care of that for you. Yeah, we know for flight, but I don't know Zoom well enough to call on you when you raise your hand. In fact, we can't open up the mic for you anyway, so I'm not quite sure how that would work. And a lot like yeah. ForeFlight itself, every time I think I'm starting to understand it, another version comes out with new features. It works differently. <laughs> I'm still getting the trying to get them to take a few months off just so we can get caught up. The exactly. changes are, are are often and they're they're monthly basically. And there's a few more this month than we had last month. So one of the questions we got, Ray, Ray asked, what's the best way to preserve battery life of the iPad between charges? If you're not going to plug it into a charger, what's the best way to preserve? Well, the biggest eater and consumer of the energy is the screen and the screen brightness. If you make it full bright because you like it, how pretty it is and how good it looks, then you're really going to chew up the battery and that's the largest drain. So what you can do is go to the iPad settings, click on accessibility, and then turn the auto brightness off. That'll keep it from going full bright if you're out in the sunlight. That's a preference you may or may not want. If the last time you flew was nighttime and you had it dimmed down, then you turn it on the daytime, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, so, you know, your choice on that, but it will save battery. If you can turn that off, it'll keep it from going full bright by itself. Then go to iPad settings again, display and screen brightness and turn the automatic mode off. And lastly, you can go to the home screen and pull down the control panel from the top right corner and then lower the brightness to the lowest tolerable level. Even if you get it down 10% off the top, that's going to significantly uh, impact your, your battery life. I've noticed a pretty big difference on that when I dim my, my screen just, just a bit. And then turn it off if you're not using it. Uh, you don't have to leave it on the whole time. Jim asks, can you cover the by altitude profiles under the aircraft section in the four flight pilots guide so sure the buy so we have several profiles we can create for our aircraft one is basic performance profiles the one that he's talking about is the by altitude performance profiles and then a third one is four flight performance profiles and for the last two you need a performance plus subscription to four flight that's the uh the highest tier subscription everybody gets the basic performance profiles so the by altitude performance is basically you're putting in the cruise performance, climb performance, descent performance, you know, by altitude, so that every thousand feet it's going to use a different set of numbers. And actually, let's uh, I think a good way to show that would be to go to the four flight web. If I let's see, if I pull up the website, you cannot set this up on the iPad. You have to go to four flight web, which is <clears throat> right here. And when you're in ForeFlight Web, you log into your account and then click on aircraft over here on the left side. 
So click on the airplane that we're trying to set up. So again, we're back in Four Flight Web on the internet, not on our iPad. We click on I aircraft on the left, and I'm going to choose my aircraft that I want to set. And then right here, you click on add performance, add basic performance profile. So we're going to add a performance profile, and then we get a choice of two, basic or by altitude. Well, the one that he was talking about is by altitude profile and it's detailed performance metrics specified per flight level or per thousand feet. I'll click on that and now we can put in a lot of different options. We're gonna name our climb mode, our descent model and our cruise model. It's defaulted to new by altitude profile. Uh, put your max ceiling in here and the, the, the lower you put this, if you never go above 6,000 feet, you can put 6,000 feet in here and then you won't have, whoops, I hit enter and uh, and then you, you know, it'll limit how many lines you have to fill out, but however many lines there are here, you have to fill all of these out. And so you'd start out and, and say your VY, I always climb at VY. So at 1000 feet, it's 76. And we know that every thousand feet VY goes down by about one knot. So put 75, 3000 feet, 74. Now I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but I will show you what it looks like when I finished it. So if I go back to my aircraft, Yes, I'm going to continue. I'm going to open up Brian's sample by altitude profile. And there's one that I filled out beforehand to save time. And you can see the VY goes down when I climb, the rate of climb goes down. Put your aircraft performance numbers in here. And if you don't know it, go take a test flight sometime and record these numbers. And then you can fill this out and you'll get much more accurate data when you're uh, um, getting the performance data for a flight. So back to the questions russ said i noticed that the weather briefing did not follow what i consider to be the standard order and a lot of us have forms we fill out and i think that's why this was picked up on that we fill out a form in a certain order and i noticed that is he noticed that is not in this order that a flight service station would normally give you your briefing in this order so what i noticed is when i looked at it he's right yeah in fact the p the four flight pdf format is in a different order and it's this order, but the HTML order is closer to this. Uh, and I, I like this order better because it takes you through a much more thorough breakdown. Uh, under each of these, you'll get a much more, much more detail, like NOTAMs is where you're gonna get all the TFRs uh, and, uh, and a lot of other stuff too. So under each of these headers, you'll get more information. So if you're seeing that, you use a certain kind of form. Although in this case, using ForeFlight, you really don't need a form. You just need to save your, uh, your briefing into ForeFlight. Stanley says, what is unknown warning 3002 in the yellow band on top of my flight? Now, the first thing that came to my mind here is, what are the other 3001 warnings? And did they, did they start at one? That's a lot of warnings for things to go wrong. Uh, so I, I actually reached out to Fl ForeFlight on that. And, and, and I would suggest that you do that as well when you get a number like that, because they can tell you immediately. Uh, but in any event, what ForeFlight said is this error results from the aircraft being unable to achieve cruise speed with the selected profile. So adjust the cruise true airspeed by going to the aircraft tab, select that aircraft, edit the custom profile and adjust the true airspeed for something more realistic. So I, you're probably dreaming about the true airspeed you wanna get, but if you put the true airspeed that you can get, then you're not gonna get that warning. Bo says, what antenna system or model do you recommend for the weather updates in flight? Um, approximately what is the lag time for the weather updates I understand in the past the weather's been about 15 minutes. Is this still true? It is for certain things. I know there's a different time for different things. And uh, uh, Mike, if you happen to know that offhand, jump in and say it. I know that like the METARs and the TAFs will come out, you know, more often. The the radar, there's different. I think the longest span is 15 minutes. I do know that to be true, but to... to for, for weather, it can be up to 25 minutes. Uh, oh, is that right? Okay. For, for the data, and that's from the FAA. Um, they have a webinar out there that'll explain how the uh, of the data weather service works. Um, oh, that's the, great. The FAA has a webinar? They do. Uh, it's a, a, a YouTube video, I believe. Okay. If you can post a link to that in the chat, that'd be yep. great. The oh, Century yeah. ADSB, that's the one I recommend. Uh, Stratus is also great. I have one of each. I like them both. Um, the new Century outweighs the old Stratus, but my Stratus outweighs the even older Sentry. So they just keep leapfrogging each other 
in, in how good they are. Four Flight and Sentry play very well together. Uh, so there'll also be a link to that in the description, YouTube description. Uh, yeah, my system I use uh, in my my aircraft. I have a, a GNS 530W. I have a GTX 345 transponder that gives me the ADS-B in data. I also have a portable. I use an XGPS 190, which also includes an AHARS in it. That's a nice backup in case your onboard equipment fails. You've got an external uh, source of AHARS data. Uh, the weather data, it depends on what type. I think mostly the concern is about radar data that's uploaded in flight. And that has the delays that James is talking about, upwards of 20, 25 minutes, depending. Actually, uh, what I've been told is when there's an active dynamic weather system there, the processing takes longer, and therefore that data is even more delayed than when it's a clear blue sky. So when you want it the most, it's even more delayed. Um, there is some information I'm trying to find it here. I, I think it's in the AIM and other sources like James talks about, uh, probably aviation weather data. There's some information on the schedule of data transmission in ADSB, uh, the, the uh, FISB. And, Very and good. I, well, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, Bob. Right. Yeah. And if I can add, um, I use a Sentry and it gets the FISB data in and it works very, very well. Uh, however, as everybody's alluding, the radar data is upwards 15 to 20 minutes old. Don't forget in the upper left of your screen, now I, I tend to use it in landscape, my iPad in landscape, but it's in the upper left is the timestamp of the last radar hit or the last collected radar data. Always remember this is that using the radar feature in ForeFlight is a strategic tool, not a tactical tool. It's not designed, you don't get up close to a cell and think you can maneuver around it. it. It cells last roughly 20 minutes. And if you're 20 minutes behind, you're in deep trouble. Right, um, there, that's a very good advice. I've got a video I shot of looking, uh, I start without breaking video. I start on my iPad showing where the thunderstorm is. On my iPad, it shows it off to the right. Then I show the weather radar in the aircraft and it shows it off to the left. And I come out to the window and there's the weather off to the left and if you went by your ipad you would turn left to avoid this weather and you would turn right into that thunderstorm so like bob says i think that's important advice stay away from thunderstorms i think in light of this week's tragedies we've had in aviation and i don't want to get into it but it really does hit home on safety it's something we're all going to keep mentioning and bringing up and that's a very important one that bob brought up is that do not use the weather radar the weather information on here for tactical avoidance use it for long range planning but and, and the time i bought i put the ipad up on the screen here so you can see and this is just internet uh for flight weather time that's 7 15 p.m central time is the time of the last when this weather mosaic was published now each of those radar pictures to put together a mosaic like a, a quilt of the whole united states well, those pictures might be taken actually before this time, but this is the time they published it. And so it could be even older than what you see on there. And if you're getting ADSB data, it'll say up here what the source is and when the latest update is. Consider anything at least 15 to 20 minutes old, or at least a few more minutes beyond the time that you see up in the corner. As I can also point out in that upper left corner time, that's the most recent data that's on board. If you tap it, when you're live, it actually opens up another window that shows you the age of the data within. Yeah, so that's a good point. If I put traffic on here as well, let's put some more data on here. Uh, then I tap the time up here, you can see the traffic, the latest update on the traffic, what time that was and what the latest time on the radar. It says 7.15, right now it's 7.25. So that tells you something, whether the, this was published 10 minutes ago when they started building that mosaic, but that might have been longer the, ago that where they actually took these screen images of the radar scan. Yeah, so. as I tell my as I tell my students, the weather radar is a history lesson. Yeah, that's true. It's where the weather was. Now, regarding that, you can talk to air traffic control. Approach control is looking at live radar. If if center air route traffic control center is helping you, um, I believe they have some updated capabilities now. But it used to be that they were just looking at this what we're looking at on our iPads. Uh, the um, next rad, which is arguably minutes old. So, all right, very good. Good discussion. Very important on safety. I think we need to really focus and hit on that because way too many people have 
relied on their next rad or the, the, the convective data they're getting in from the, uh, the TISB information in the ADSBN and it's not right. It's not, it's not current enough for them to be avoiding a thunderstorm, so to speak. So good, good talk. All right. Next question. Robert says, I've attended each workshop other than the first one, which I did via webinar and I checked my FA wings credit and noticed that I've only received credit for the first workshop and the third. Um, I know a lot of people have been sending me messages about not getting wings credit. And then I go to try to give wings credit with that email and I get this request failed uh, message here. And it says you've already accepted for that user. So what I'd like you to do is when you're trying to see if you've got wings credit, let's just do a quick wings tutorial. Uh, go to the FAAsafety.gov website and in the middle of the page, you'll see this wings box down at the bottom. You'll see the my wings link. And if you click on that, you'll get a page and lower on that page, you'll see about halfway down, you'll see these tabs and you'll click on your wings logbook. And after you click on your wings logbook, you'll see the several levels here and you'll click on um, basic wings level and then go down and you'll see the knowledge topic one. This one is knowledge topic three and you can see how many credits are unapplied credits towards your, you may see them here. They may be applied toward a wings level. This one is most likely going to be unapplied if you don't see it. So look down here and you'll see a list of all the uh, uh, the, the wings of events for which you've received credit, but they're not being applied toward a phase of wings. You can also go to the bottom and you'll see this wings credit history timeline at the bottom of the wings page under my wings. And you can hover over that little square down there. And when you hover over it, you're going to see all of the events for which you've received credit during that month. So that's another way to see and make sure that you got wings credit for something. Anyway, enough on the wings. And yeah, another thing on that, Brian, I see quite often is pilots will have two accounts set up and their credit is granted to one account, but they're usually using the other one. So make sure that you've registered for this program with the correct email address. And that's the one where the credit will go. I, I see that a lot. Yeah, good point. And I, I know that in the registration form that I've created for these presentations, I have a field you can fill out where if you're using a registration email other than your wings credit email, there's another field where you can put the email address that you use for your faasafety.gov wings account. And we'll be sure to use that one if you give that one to us uh, as well when you registered. Uh, if you have any problems with that, again, just email us at fourflightworkshops.com. If you got any more questions, comments, concerns, we try to get to them all as fast as we can. There's a lot, obviously. Uh, we do get to every one of them. And if, if we can't get to it, I'll reach out to Foreflight if I can't answer a question as well. They have uh, great customer service. It's team at foreflight.com. I would encourage you, if, if you want to email them as well, uh, they have always gotten back to me and they're very good about doing so in a, in a timely fashion. Again, just to review the different accounts, the different subscription plans that you can have, there's basic pro and performance. They all say plus at the end, and that's just to confuse you. They're all plus. So I just say basic pro and performance. There's the base price. If you happen to be a NAFI member, you don't have to be certainly, uh, but we'd love to have you join NAFI. You're going to get a lot of educational content, but on top of that, you get a lot of great discounts. But in this case for four flight, it's 33% off. And you can see that's pretty significant. And with our discount code of S49, uh, you can join for $49. And if you get the performance plan, you can see you're going to save about $120 and it only costs you $49 to do so. So I'm just doing that to help you save money. I'm not making a pitch for anything, but you will get a lot more out of uh, NAPI than your $49 pays for. So, I mean, you're going to get a lot out of it. A lot of educational content. You're here because you like it, obviously. Uh, you'll get a lot more by being a NAPI member. And our magazine is not bad either. And I say our because I'm on the board of directors. So uh, give you that disclosure as well. This uh, just came out today. You may have noticed in the slideshow, the pregame slideshow, that, that these were all red. Well, ForeFlight Mobile today came out with, uh, it's compatible with uh, iPad iOS and uh, iPad OS and iOS 17.0.2. Uh, ForeFlight's good to go. And also, if you don't want to upgrade to that yet, it's still also, it's approved for 16.7 or iPad OS 16.7. Both of those, I think when you go to update your iPad operating system software, you have a choice to go to 16.7, 
or version seven or uh, 17. If you if you don't want to do that yet, you can just upgrade to 16. I think you see that choice when you go for the upgrade or the update. So also iPad, this came out last month before, or a month ago, two months ago, four flight on Apple Watch. Just wanted to show you some of the things you can see. I don't want to get into how to set that up. If It should be automatic if you have your updates set and you have the latest versions of the iOS, but you can get airport information. Under each airport, you can get summary of the airport. You can get the frequencies, uh, all the frequencies for that airport. You can get weather for that airport. I like to leave the frequencies up on my watch when I'm flying, and I don't have to go searching for them when I'm flying around at different airports. Under the weather tab, you can see you can METARs, TAFs, even the model output statistics, the daily and the hourly observations as well. And you can go to the... Uh, you also get winds aloft. You'll see runways and you'll see NOTAMs. Uh, all of that is just information in there. You can't do any flight plan planning per se, but there's a lot of good information in there, like pattern altitude and frequencies. That's what I'm always seem to be looking for as I approach an airport and it's right there on my watch. So that's kind of cool as well. And there's the runways and you can see a lot of information about each runway while you're there. And then the, uh, Notams are on there as well, and it happens to be that this airport had a lot of notams. <laughs> so, in any event, it's on the fourth flight on the Apple Watch. It's pretty cool. The uh, this month, our changes. We got six new changes, and we'll go over those. Uh, and again, these are listed in the back of the fourth flight um, user guide, uh, month by month. So this month, fifteen point nine. We've got a new beta radar layer, and a lot of people are probably applauding about that. This is good for all plans, basic, pro, and performance. Uh, it doesn't look like the uh, Minecraft pixelated boxes of radar anymore. It looks a lot better, um, and it's more timely. More timely returns based on the same data is what they're saying as well in that layer. So enable that layer. Again, it's just below the existing one, in the, uh, and we'll look at that when we go to the iPad, but it's in the same place that you always used to go to to turn on the weather radar layer. Another thing is when you, if you make map annotations, rather than undoing or clearing the whole thing, you can actually just erase pieces of it. So there's an eraser on the uh, map annotations now. That's, uh, and that's on all plans. The logbook filtering now, that's for performance plan only. Uh, if you use the logbook, you can search for past entries. You can search by a date range or a certain airplane or people. A lot of different ways you can search, and it helps you find a flight a lot easier uh, or destinations as well. Like how many, have I ever been to this airport or when was I there? Another uh, interesting one that I'll show you is the profile line pointer. Uh, it should, instead of just a dot moving along your flight plan, now it shows you uh, a line moving across the corridor. Uh, so you can easily see and find hazards. All you do is when you're looking at the profile and you need pro or performance for this, the basic won't have it. Um, you just tap and hold within the profile view. Uh, in fact, why don't I just show it to you here? We go to the iPad, I've got a flight in here. And if I go up here and open my flight plan and then tap on profile, you can see a profile here. And all you gotta do is just take your finger in this area tap it down and you can see if you drag along here you can see the hazards along your quarter now i'm going to zoom in on this because we've got some mountains here you can see the quarter width that i've set there and again you tap along here and well i got lucky once it worked so i'm gonna do it by by hand here and you drag along and you can see it moving along the width of your corridor what the highest obstacle is inside that corridor. And you can see as you get over here, you can you can also expand that out. And we see during our descent, we've got a couple of uh, strikes on the hill. It gets kind of close. What turns red and what turns yellow is based on what you set. So sometimes helicopters might not think that something is a hazard, but an airplane would. A helicopter pilot might go into the, uh, the settings on that. And you can see on the hazard altitudes, well, we got normal. Anything within a hundred feet of us turns red within a thousand, I'm sorry. Yeah, red within a thousand feet turns yellow. But if you're flying a helicopter below a thousand feet all the time, your screen's gonna always be yellow. So there's a helicopter, normal, medium and low. And maybe you're flying a, an Aronka Champ or a Piper Cub and you never really go above a thousand feet either. So you can select one of these helicopter layers so that you really only get it turning yellow and red at these altitudes as well. And so that's, that's what that is. 
let's see i'll go back to the uh powerpoint what else new we've got um and this is for all plans is that you can hide airspace activated by NOTAM. And that's kind of an interesting one. Uh, some airspaces are there all the time. Some airspace published are only there or only active when the NOTAM says that they are. You'll see it in the chart. When is this airspace hot? Well, it says by NOTAM. And so you can go to the ForeFlight. Let's see if I can find one here. If not, if I can't find it soon, then we'll just uh, move on. But here, if I select that mode this is uh while you're in here let me turn off the traffic and radar so we get a cleaner picture and while we're in here i'll zoom out a bit and we'll go to actually we have hiding filtered airspace down here you'll see that notice because i am hiding something i have filtered my airspace what and so you can click on that what have I filtered? Well, I'm hiding airspace above 12,000 because I'm flying, I'm never gonna go above 12,000 on my airplane. So I'm hiding all airspace above that. And this is for the aeronautical layer, not the sectional. The sectional is always gonna look the same. So if you have the aeronautical layer turned off, you'll see you, you just don't have that option there. So I'll turn that back on, go back over here and look at my options for that. And you'll see activation by NOTAM. So let me just turn the sectional off so I can make this really crystal clear. And we'll come back here, click on the banner, and we'll turn activation by NOTAM on. Oh, you can see, I'll toggle it back and forth, and you can see an MOA that's appearing and disappearing. So what this does is, while you've got that turned on, it's going to show you it all the time when you've got activation by NOTAM. and correct me if i'm wrong on this but what I, it says disabling activation by NOTAM will hide airspaces that are only activated by NOTAM. well what if it's activated by NOTAM? will it show you i'm not sure and i don't want i don't want to give an answer to that that i don't know if uh, mike you or james or bob know the answer to that uh, pipe in but it's hiding all the airspace that's active by NOTAM only what this tells me is for that moa i need to check my NOTAMs. So anyway, that's the new feature. Well, um, while we're at, while we're live, I'll go hunting to see if there's one that's hot. And we'll okay, yeah, if you can, I, I, one that would normally not be there by NOTAM. So, uh, okay, thank you. The last new feature this month is the uh, runway analysis, missed approach climb requirements. Uh, this is only for the Performance Plus profile. Most people don't use this, and it's more for high performance type aircraft. Uh, but in this case, you'll get some more detail, more accurate detail, and actually some support from ForeFlight on that. So I'm not going to get into detail on that, but that is a newer feature and upgrade to the runway performance. We may do another workshop talking about the performance profiles and some runway data and the more advanced one. We might just make a recording of one and put it on the YouTube channel. So moving on, let's get into some of the settings. We'll continue from where we went last month. And we'll go to the iPad right now. So here in the iPad, you can see where sunset is right now because I've got that turned on. <laughs> it's dark here. And those of you over where Mike lives, it's kind of uh, not dark. Anyway, uh, I'll turn back on the sectional. And we're going to go to settings. And I'm going to pick up on annotations. Uh, so up here, we're going to hit the More tab tap on settings. And again, just to review, the easiest way to find something is to type it right here. If I know I'm looking for, I want to change the color of my, what they call the own ship, my own airplane, just start typing own ship and boy, there's, it just starts filtering it out. It filters by whatever you type. If I'm looking for the hazard advisor, I just start typing hazard. There it is. So that filter is a very powerful tool up there and can save a lot of time rather than you know, just hunting through all of these settings. So I want to go to annotations and pick up right here. You'll notice up here on the top, this gray bar sticks to the top. And I showed you that on a previous workshop. Worth repeating that whatever setting category you're on sticks to the top. And so I'm going to go down here to annotations, find the top of it. So turning it on and off. I know we got a question before the webinar started. Somebody asked about that. You can turn that off. And you can see right here, this annotation button. If I just, if I know I'm never gonna use it, I, don't, I just wanna get rid of that button, take it off, just turn it off. 
I'm going to turn it back on. Apple Pencil Drawing, Auto Apple Pencil Drawing. If you have an Apple Pencil, I recommend you turn that on. It'll work a lot better. Annotation <clears throat> Timeout. And this is a feature that came out, I don't know, several months ago, a year ago. But how long do you want the annotations mode to turn itself off? Used to be it stayed on as long as you left it on. And what would happen is <laughs> you would turn annotations on. Let me close the settings here. And we'll go back to annotations. I'll turn it on. And anywhere that I move the map, I start trying to move things or zoom in. Now, two fingers will allow zooming, and you can pan with two fingers. But if I try to pan with one finger, I, it's not working. And I've had a lot of people call me and say, why do I have these stripes all over my thing? Well, if I did something, let's say I wanted to go here, and I'm just circling this airport for future reference, whatever annotation I make, I leave it alone. The annotations are going to time out, and it's going to act as though you deselected this button right here after a certain period of time see how it just went away all by itself and and now i can tap i can move with one finger and it uh it uh, it, it doesn't write you don't end up writing on the chart inadvertently so you, to erase everything and we can look at that new feature i'll tap on that i can turn the eraser on right here and now i can just kind of wherever i wipe i'm erasing i can kind of selectively erase or I can undo the last thing I did with that button. Or I just want to clear the whole thing. I'll push this clear button right here. Clear annotations. And that gets rid of everything. Then I'll go back here and manually turn that back off. All right. So we'll go back to settings. More settings. And while I'm doing this, I'm just going to turn that off. You don't need to see the pop top of my head looking down on my iPad. Um, the annotations timeout so i have it set for 10 seconds i think five is probably good enough if i haven't touched it in five seconds i'm probably finished annotating on my chart all right the next one is the checklist you can have a choice if you have the checklist and i don't think that's on every plan i think it's just on pro and performance um, you can have it read you the challenge and you're going to say out loud the response or you can have it read you the challenge and response so that when it tells you reads a checklist item it's also telling you what the answer is basically uh, and so i would like to say it should be challenge response response in other words if it tells you the challenge and response reading you the checklist and four flights a great co-pilot that way uh, you want to still respond the response that it already told you the answer you want to respond when it's done just to, it's a great way to mentally say i've completed that item or you can select challenge only and it'll just say gear and then you're supposed to say down in three green if you select challenge and response you say it'll say gear down in three green and then you'll repeat down in three green so that's that's the only option on the checklist on plates and documents views you can turn on lock disables buttons so what that is is there's a lock button on there and if you lock your plate with this turned on you also disable the buttons that are on that chart. Uh, if you don't have this turned on, then you can lock your screen. It won't rotate, but you can still hit the buttons on the uh, documents. And I'm not going to go show that. The traffic settings, you can hide distant traffic uh, from your ADSB, and this is only on ADSB, not on internet traffic. Uh, if you turn that on, it will get rid of traffic that's far away from you, although I've not seen that work yet. I still seem to get traffic that's far away that I don't care about. And then traffic breadcrumbs is a new feature you can also see where if you tap on a traffic, um, you'll be able to see where they've been. And again, I'm not on ADSB right now. The reason it says ADSB or FLARM is, uh, is because that's uh, the kind of traffic you have to be receiving to use that feature. Right now, I'm just on the internet. I turn the internet traffic on, I can't see that. The breadcrumbs on while you're on ADSB, you can tap on a traffic and you can see where they've been, what they're doing. Maybe they're doing a holding pattern. You didn't know that until you tapped on the traffic and saw their breadcrumbs in a holding pattern, right turns at a certain VOR, then you might help you avoid them. Search and rescue settings. If you're not, I don't do search and rescue. Uh, I hate, hate to admit, I would love to get in Civil Air Patrol and do more of that. I think that would be a lot of fun, but there are a lot of features. I turn that off. Uh, there probably are people on here. We've got a lot of people here. Uh, who do search and rescue. I'm not going to go over the features. We could probably do a lesson on that in and of itself. I have that turned off. Um, 
search and rescue waypoints is latitude longitude is new uh, i'm just going to go ahead and turn that off too because i don't use search and, and rescue but there are some great patterns that it can give you to fly search and rescue patterns you can play with that by turning it on and off but if you don't use that go ahead and leave it off the downloads are are a good one and we're going to leave the settings tab and actually go look at the downloads tab but for now yes or no do you want background downloads you want it to be downloading in the background yes or no i do i want it to go ahead and do that uh, but i don't want it doing it over my cellular so i'm gonna go ahead and turn that off so here i'm allowing it to work in the background but i've got it turned off if i'm on cellular because i have limited data automatic downloads it'll automatically go get them anytime you open up for flight and there's an update it'll go get them if you have this turned on and in this case with this turned off the cellular turned off uh, you are also on the internet. So if you open for flight, there's an update and you have automatic turned on then, and you're on the internet, it will go get them while you have for flight open. If you close for flight, it will stop downloading. Uh, in fact, it says here when automatic downloads is enabled data updates, don't ignore the notes down here. Sometimes they'll teach you more than I can. Uh, the downloads view automatically download over Wi-Fi when the app is open. If you close the app, it'll stop downloading. And in fact, it'll warn you now. You've probably seen it. You're downloading updates and it closes the app. Uh, you close the app and you get a warning that says, hey, uh, to resume, reopen for flight. So while we're talking about the downloads, uh, I want to go ahead and go to the more tab. And instead of settings up top, we're going to click on downloads. This is where you control how much you're going to download, what's going to stay on your iPad uh, and, and not have to be downloaded online. You want to go take it with you while you're flying. You want it on board the iPad. So the first thing is you have data settings and you have region settings. So the first thing is, what kind of data do I want? So I'm going to tap on data settings. What do I want? I like airport text and diagrams. I like terminal procedures because those are approach plates. I'm, I fly IFR. Uh, if you don't fly IFR and you don't think you'll ever look at that, you can turn that off and save a lot of memory uh, and leave VFR charts on. Uh, if you strictly fly IFR, well, I'd certainly want the terminal procedures. I probably would also want the VFR charts. If you only fly, there's IFR low and high. If you only fly below 18,000 feet, you, you, know, you have no need for the IFR high charts. You can turn those off. So right here is where you select what you want what kind of charts you what kind of information you want what data do you want ifr planning and ocean charts uh, the ifr planning charts are nice helicopter charts are also nice because they give you they're a little bit easier to read so i go ahead and download those and then you can also search for street addresses in the global search window up here if you've got this turned on it's going to download the street database of all the addresses in the united states it's a lot of data if you're limited you can discriminate here and turn some of these things off what really uses a lot of memory is the high resolution base map and terrain, but it's a great feature to have to know if, especially if you're flying down low. So I have the United States. If you never go to Alaska or Hawaii, you can save a lot of data by turning those off. Even though that's a region, they're triple, they're triple bifurcating, I should say, or dividing the uh, high resolution base map. I do go there, so I want to leave those on. Um, Canada, if you don't go there, you can turn that off as well. Turn off everything that you're not going to use to save data. And we've gotten to the bottom. These are the different regions. And you'll see if I turn one of these on that I don't have, uh, it'll tell you, it'll, well, down here it says you need to have a certain subscription. Uh, so I probably won't get it. And it'll probably offer to let me pay more. So I've selected all of the data settings. That's the data that I want. Well, for where do I want it? So now we go over here to back and we'll go to the region settings. If I tap on region settings, I want uh, the United States. Did you know there's 54 states? Well, I have a, everywhere selected uh, because I fly all over the United States. I want to have it. So every state is selected. If you only fly in three states, we'll deselect all the ones you don't need. You can see how much data you're going to use for getting this information that you selected for data settings in the region that you select on the region settings. So if I never go to any of these states, I can deselect them and it's going to save a lot of memory on my iPad. I like to have them all. 
because I got a lot of memory. I'm going to go ahead and just download them all. If memory is a problem, just get what you need. Just if you're only flying in your own home state and you never leave, that's really the only one you need. So you can go through this and set them all for the United States. Uh, and then we can go to Canada, same thing. Where in Canada are you going? I have them all selected because the one time I don't have it selected is the one time I'm going to go there. Europe, Australia, Caribbean, uh, Europe and Australia require separate subscriptions and you can select them if you pay for that subscription. Uh, and it tells you here, uh, a four flight Europe subscription is required uh, and you click on learn more and they're happy to sell you more uh, product. Caribbean, Mexico, Central America, uh, that's, um, I think in, that's included in my plan because it's available here and I have that selected because I do fly down there. So you can select the areas that you're going to want to download. If you want to start this fresh, you can clear them all by hitting the clear button up here and then select the few that you want. If you want to offload everything, when you're looking at this page, you can just click delete right here and you can delete all downloads or you can delete the expired ones, which may be in there as well and haven't been deleted yet. Uh, it may be something that you packed and you can delete expired and it'll get rid of it if it's old. Uh, but deleting all downloads gives you a fresh start. If you're going to be home and you're on a Wi-Fi and you can leave it on all night, plugged in, then you can delete all downloads, select what you want, and then hit download again. So that's just a little deeper dive into the download setting and how you choose. So just to review, choose what you want in the data settings, IFR, VFR, planning charts, all that. And then for what region do you want that data in the region settings? Probably pretty much under the United States. We probably, we have people not just in the United States watching these workshops. So that's why I'm mentioning all these other uh, regions. We probably have people from these uh, different regions as well. So once we've got that set, we hit download and let it ride. We'll close that and we'll go back to the settings. So we'll get up past download. So pack auto, enable auto check. So this is where you plan a flight and then you see the red exclamation point next to the word pack. Uh, in fact, you can see one up here on my flight plan. Uh, well, that's not the error here. A uh, max usable fuel. This is too long a flight, this one that I put on here. Uh, and I can zoom to Go to the edit page. Edit. Oh, yeah. So here we have the pack. Yeah, the, yeah there. Thank you. There you go. Uh, the pack suitcase has the uh, exclamation point on it and it auto checked. And it showed me, okay, here's the corridor, a 50 mile corridor uh, of my route. You can, these are all the things that I'm missing. So I'm going to go ahead and hit pack. This will probably slow down my zoom connection and make my sound go away. But anyway, uh, I'm now packing for this trip that I've planned and you can see it's getting everything. And that exclamation point, I'm all packed. That exclamation point is now gone, but with that setting selected, enable auto check, you're going to get that exclamation point. If you're missing something that you need, I recommend you have that on. So pack confirms you have everything you need for the flight you've planned and every state that touches that 50 mile corridor on your route will be downloaded when, it, when you pack for it. Back to settings, the track log. So Enable start stop control. That's right here. I have a record button for my track log. I have that turned on and there's also enable auto start stop. Well, every time I drive somewhere, it starts recording if I have four flight open and I have all these track logs. So I could turn that off. That way it won't start recording when I'm just driving in my car, but I have the button turned on so I can start recording by hitting right here, hit record. And now it's recording my track log. I generally do that when I start the engine. I hit record and then I know what to log for the flight. When we shut down at the end of the flight, I stop recording and I have the time there. I have a track log. Uh, if I were to turn that off, the, uh, where'd it go? Track log, enable start stop control. That's gonna clean up my, if you never use that, you can, get rid of that as well. So this record button will go away when I turn this off. So again, cleaning up all the buttons that we don't use here by going to our settings. I like it. I like to turn it on and off. So I'm going to leave that on my screen. The, uh, let's see, just so you know, in case you're wondering what those track logs are, I'll show you. If we go to the more tab, tap on track logs, 
I missed it. It's very, very sensitive. You got to touch it in the right place. If I tap on track logs, these are all the track logs. And here's a flight that I did the other day. And there's the track log right there. Don't judge me by my ability to hold altitude, airspeed, or fly a straight line. <laughs> we don't do any of those things in my Cetabria. <laughs> yeah, so that's, the, yeah. And the nice thing about that is you can ex export that track log to something like uh, Pot Ahoy and use it there. Yeah, it's great for debriefing. If you're a flight instructor, you can take this track log that you've recorded. I mean, if you have the pro plan, you can actually play it and put it in 3D and watch the flight we can put it up speed it up to 10 times and then we'll move along to uh let's see if i can get this to happen 15 minutes into it and sped it up to 10 times real time and you can watch your flight by hitting play and take a look at what that looks like you can also do this in a pre-flight plan that you've looked at you can see this is ahar's data so it's going to show bank angle bank and pitch on here you can also change your point of view to cockpit point of view or from like trailing aircraft, chasing aircraft point of view. It's uh, it's pretty neat for debriefing because you can show maneuvers, uh, see how you held your altitude, but even better since four flight bot cloud ahoy, like Bob was saying, you can hit this send to button and send it to, where do I want to open this? Open KML in, now it's building the file and I can open it in Cloud Ahoy. And I'll just tap on that for now and we'll just import that. And I, I don't know if I wanna go through all this, but you can do a great, wonderful debrief in here. It'll, Cloud Ahoy will recognize what you've already, the maneuvers that you've done. Uh, it knows slow flight from uh, steep turns and stalls and it, it, it separates them and gives you a score if you pay for it. Uh, I can give you a score without paying me, so <laughs> uh, I don't pay for it. In any event, uh, that's the track log. If we go back to the map, go back to settings, and I have the track log, I do record mine. So in flights now, this is the option where I was mentioning before, the briefing format didn't follow the flight service station for format in the PDF. You can do PDF format or you can do graphical. You get a lot more information on graphical or HTML. HTML is like a website looking briefing. Uh, and those are just two different choices. Try them both. If you change it, refresh your briefing and it'll go get a new one and change it to the new format. And you can check that out. Enable fuel orders. That's new to me. I'm gonna be honest with you. I've not seen that before. Uh, I think if you turn that on, I know you can go to airports. I'm gonna guess here, if we go to airports, I've seen where you can, uh, Choose the FBO, uh, no FBO there. Let's check McKinney, Texas, check FBO. And uh, it may be on here where I choose an FBO uh, and I can order fuel. I know you can send emails, you can get a lot of information about them. So if one of you guys knows, let me know. You can call them, right? If you're on your iPhone looking, you can tap this button here and call them. You can tap this and just immediately send them an email. And uh, you can order, you know, tell them, hey, I'm coming at this time. I'm not sure what that enable fuel order is. So if anybody knows, chime in. We'll go back to settings and we'll go to taxi diagram. Uh, auto show taxi. That's going to show the taxi um, diagram when you, right after you land, it's going to show the taxi diagram pop up on your map, uh, which is very useful. Uh, so that because that's what you're going to do when you after you land is taxi i would hope and then you get the taxi diagram pop up on your map which is kind of handy if you turn that on Brian, uh show ta yeah i'm sorry i'm going to go backwards on the fuel order thing for a half a second go ahead yeah fuel orders exposes the fuel order field and flights view blah 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 it's used to create and send fuel orders to your destination fbo before the flight performance accounts only okay so if we go to the flights view and choose one of our flights um, it shows the fuel order. And you scroll down a little bit more. Fuel policy, minimum fuel required. Uh, it's above F des F destination fuel services. Order. There you go. There it is. Order fuel. Well, there you go. I can order the quantity. I guess, will this send a message to them? Yeah, apparently. 
Yeah. Yeah. I've used it once. Uh, uh, and they were waiting with the truck when I got there. Wow. That's amazing. Well, that's pretty cool. So order your fuel here. It probably yeah. doesn't work if you go to a small airport with a self-service only fuel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the pump will reach you. The Maybe pump won't just come over to your airplane and uh, <laughs> fill you so up. Serious. Exactly. <laughs> Um, and I want to go back on that NOTAM thing for just a moment. Sure. Mike's airspace. I'm going to give a qualified, if there's an active, because I hunted around. <laughs> Naturally, there's nothing out there right now. But I hunted around, and based on a TF, couple of TFRs that I found that are out ahead. Yeah. Future TFRs. I believe that if you, tur if you hide, uh, unless they're turned on by NOTAM, I believe that um they will show up because there's a note on it so if you you're hiding it with the switch off right. you won't see it unless there it's notum active unless there's yeah and the note and i found i found one down south where there's a future uh, there's an air show down in southern california or somewhere i can't couldn't begin to tell you i had to hunt all over the country to find it um uh, there's an air show coming up on the 6th and I hid the activation. I hit it and yet the red was still, it was still highlighted in red by four flight. Okay. So I know like here, if I, I, I yeah, I'd, I would double check that for sure. Before you go plowing into airspace that you're not familiar. I know I saw it. I think it may be over here somewhere. Uh, activation by NOTAM. So these are, sh it's showing the ones that, I turn it off their airspace that's activated by NOTAM it's turned off but that does that mean it's active or inactive I don't know check your NOTAMs that's all I'm going to say on that for now uh, we will answer that later more positively I just don't want to give misinformation on that right I'm giving a qualified that's how it works and we'll right it. okay all right all right where do we leave off we left off on uh track logs flights taxi diagram okay so the last section on here is preferences I thought that's what we were talking about the whole time but i would call it miscellaneous preferences so the first one is alerts and there are a lot of alerts um some of them handy some of them not i have them all turned on because i just want to see what what they're like you can have it the alerts will pop up on your screen as a little banner that you can tap to make it go away or it can also speak the alerts and if you have a bluetooth headset that works great you'll hear it if you're connected to uh, anything via your, even your airplane via Bluetooth where you get the audio, you'll get the spoken alert, 500 feet, a cabin altitude alert. If your cabin altitude exceeds like 10,000 feet, the transition altitude, and that's when you're climbing out of 17,500 feet on your way higher, uh, you need to set 2992 as the pressure altitude that we use for flight levels. So it'll warn you about that. Runway proximity, I would never turn that off. I, if I'm getting, if I'm taxiing near a runway, I want to know it. Uh, it'll tell you approaching the runway, and it'll tell you when you've entered the runway. But you may have occasion to turn that off. Uh, final approach alerts. Uh, that's if you know if, if you're on final and there's traffic ahead of you. Uh, sync rate will also uh, let you know if you have an excessive sync rate. Terrain obstacle alerts. Uh, your device temperature is now. Uh, an alert as well. If your device gets too hot, that's a bad thing to see. Uh, and and the only place that I've found to mount the iPad in my Satabri is up in the overhead in the window, but it just gets too hot. And we've had that discussion on a previous workshop. What devices can you get? There are some of those uh, cases with cooling fans. Keep it in the shade. Uh, it will get hot and it'll shut down until it cools off. And I like that device temperature alert because it happens before the iPad actually overheats and shuts off. Back Good in the point. old days, it would just stop going and then you'd have a blank screen. So that's a in nice In the old feature. days, in the old days, we didn't have iPads. What? <laughs> We've always had iPads. Right. Yeah, no, that's good to know that it'll let you know before it actually shuts down instead of just shutting down. Right. I like that. So I'll leave that on as well. Airspace alerts, that's kind of annoying if you're frequently flying in a very complex area because it's going to keep alerting you, but it could save your bacon from flying into a, a airspace uh, that you are supposed to be talking to somebody before you enter like uh, uh, Bravo, Charlie, or Delta. The altitude buffers, uh, 
for TFRs, this is when is it going to let you know that you're approaching a TFR? I'll, I want to know when I'm within 2,000 feet um, of the TFR. I want to know when I'm within 500 feet of airspace. In other words, if I'm more than 500 feet above the airspace, it's not going to warn me about it. If I'm within 500 feet of the altitude of that airspace, it's going to warn me about it. The TFR, if I'm within 2,000 feet, I want to know about it. Uh, it just opens that up a little bigger. I like a bigger envelope there for avoiding a TFR. The airspace alert range. Well, so that's the altitude. How about the range? So how far do you want to know that you're approaching a TFR? Three minutes or maybe three miles. You can choose whether it's a distance or whether it's a time. I'd like to, the important thing to me is that I have time to avoid it. <laughs> so three minutes is good. Two minutes is probably good enough, but three is a little bit better. Choose your, your poison there on uh and, and the airspace alert types well what kind of airspace do you want to know about if i'm approaching alpha bravo charlie i want to know about delta yeah i'm supposed to be talking to somebody so i want to know about that an air traffic zone um, i don't know where any are but if i approach one i want to know it military air traffic zone and uh, transponder mandatory zone i got them all turned on i figure any of these requires some action by me so i've got them turned on if you routinely uh, fly in and out of one of these and you just the alert is a nuisance you can turn that off uh, let's see uh, where are we at airspace type alerts okay so devices I, I just got this one the other day device disconnect I had a, a battery die in my uh, I didn't plug in or charge my Stratus before I went flying and it, it, the battery just died while I was up. I knew it was going to happen. But when that happened, I got a notice that popped up on my screen that said Stratus disconnected. That was kind of nice to know. Uh, that way I knew I wasn't getting traffic information anymore. Flight plan auto update. Uh, if your flight plan has been updated, you'll get notifications. I like to leave that turned on. Uh, connected portable device battery low. So just before this device disconnect happened, I got the connected portable device battery low. So I got a warning that that was about to happen. And that's supported on the Sentry, the Stratus, the XAR1, and Garmin portables, as it says here. The destination weather frequency alerts, that's giving you, like when you approach an airport, uh, the ATIS, if it's a towered airport, you'll see the weather frequency, or if it's not a towered airport, if there's a weather frequency, it pops up, ASOS or ATIS, uh, you'll get a little banner pop up with the frequency. And um, I had a student frustrated because he couldn't see the airport because the banner was hiding it. And below the frequency, it says tap to hide. So all you got to do is tap on it to make that go away. The airborne traffic alerts, uh, if you're flying in certain places where traffic is very congested, like uh, Los Angeles Basin, uh, this can be a nuisance and you can turn that off. I like to have it on. Traffic on runway alerts. So if you're on short final and there's aircraft on the runway, it's going to tell you. Uh, that's, that's a new feature that came out a couple months ago. And again, traffic on short final alerts. You can turn these on and off. And that covers the alerts. So let's go back to settings. And you can set all the units that you use. If you use, I have an airspeed indicator that's miles per hour. So I have that set here. Where is it? Aircraft speed. Uh, well, it's in knots. This should be miles per hour. And that's what it's going to show when I'm looking at my instrument panel down here. And it shows my speed. You can see it's in miles per hour. It will also be the same when you're looking at your flight plan uh, and your, your flight log and everything like that. It'll convert everything to miles per hour and file your flight plan in miles per hour as well. So that's where you set whether you use it miles per hour or not. It's very important that you, if you do like we do use miles per hour, that when you get the weather, you know, it's also going to put it in miles per hour. But if you call or get a weather briefing from an online source, not for flight, then it's going to give it to you in, uh, in knots. You need to make sure that you convert that if you're doing your flight planning. Uh, let's see. Uh, back to units. So you can see all there are, there are various units here. The coordinates have different formats too. And you can see uh, that how you want to enter coordinates if you're going to do so. This is a good place to look and see what is the format. So this is uh, um, degrees dot decimal degrees. So it's like if you're 43 
43.5 degrees north, that would be 43.5 degrees minutes would be 43 degrees 30 minutes decimal sec, uh, decibel minutes as well. So it's like 30.5 minutes, or you can do degrees, minutes, and seconds. And these are the different formats that you can use. And, and this not... was a source of confusion last month. You you talked about how to make a, a circle around a point, I think, and mm -hmm. using the airport reference point. We got a couple of emails about that. And I think this is exactly the point of the confusion right there, that somebody was using uh, decimal deg degrees dot decimals instead of degrees dot minutes. Yes. And the result is if you say uh, 0 0.50, that's a half of a decimal, but it's 50 minutes, which is, you know, five sixths of a degree. So it's going to be a different position. So right. It, it, make sure you're using the right one. Yeah. And here, like in this format, degrees, minutes, decimal minutes, you're, you're going to have a space between degrees and minutes where up here it's degrees, point decimal degrees. It's going to be degrees and a decimal between rather than a space in between. Uh, so the formatting is a little bit different and also if you put it in incorrectly you could wind up um, seeing a, a waypoint in a much different spot than you expected so like mike said 0.5 is not the same as 50 minutes so be careful about that um, visibility you want it in statute miles or nautical coordinates again the the there the aircraft speed miles per hour distance well if i'm measuring a distance and i'm i've got a miles per hour on my airspeed indicator well i might as well put statute miles how in, in my measurement where am i measuring well if i put two fingers on my ipad of course you can measure distances here and you can see it's showing statute miles if i measure something and you can see right here it's in statute miles and I see several questions in the Q&A on this. So no, this is a global four flight setting. It's not attached to the, which airplane you're flying. So if you have one, one airplane that's in miles per hour, or one airplane in knots, you got to pick one or the other for four flight. And that's one of those things, you know, if enough of you send an email to four flight and suggest that this a measuring unit should be attached to the airplane and not to four flight, maybe they'll add that. That's correct. But if you look on the aircraft, it does have units here. When you set up an airplane, uh, you can choose miles per hour or knots, and that's when you set up your stall speed, glide speed. It's what are these? That's miles per hour or knots. The global settings that Mike referred to, what we're setting in here in the settings and units, these are what you're going to see on the map, on the four flight map, uh, and other places as well, and and in the uh, the nav log as well. I, I will tell you that the alerts for the different uh, airspeeds, um, even though it says in knots, if your aircraft is set up for miles per hour, it will still warn you at the appropriate knots uh, for that uh, particular setting. What do you mean? So what, what airspeed warning would you get? Uh, there's one for um, a train. It's set for so many minutes or uh, sorry, so, such a distance, it'll it'll tell you out loud if you have it set in nautical miles, but then you go back after the fact and change your settings to miles uh, to miles instead of uh, nautical miles, it will give you those warnings at the nautical miles instead of miles. I see. Okay, well, that's good to know. Um, thanks for that. I appreciate hey, Brian, it. Yeah. This is a question that I can't answer in the chat. It'd be easier to show on screen. Can you go back to, your, to the map for a moment? Sure. And to your flight plan. And could you tap on that error? This? Yeah. Okay. So for the, for the person who's asking that and for everybody else, if there's an error in the in your flight, such as an altitude the airplane can't handle or a speed, uh, for example, every I have a 737 profile in my in four flight, and I'll sometimes do a flight at 6,000 feet and forget that, that it's showing the 737. Uh, it's going to come back and say, are you kidding? So, <laughs> you know, not, not quite in those words, but you get the idea. Right. So, yeah. Th so that's, that's what that error is all about is, is if you're exceeding your max, if you're exceeding a minimum or a if you're not making a minimum or you're exceeding a maximum, that type of yeah, thing. Yeah. And here's another one. I, I just made my route shorter. So I definitely have enough fuel to do that, but here's the error. And I'm guessing it's going to have something to do with my, it's like, Hey, this is too short to go to 12,000 feet. Yep. Yeah. Cruise 3,000 or lower. So I'll just say, okay, yeah, use 3,000. Fix it for me. 
boom, now the error is gone. So a lot of times it'll give you the suggestion that you can accept uh, on that as well. And again, for this new route, it now wants me to pack. I need all the things for this new route. And, uh, and, and that's there as well. The so, other thing is when, when you had KSRR in your flight plan, your route there, uh, it has a couple alert notums. There's a runway closed. So it's, it's giving you a notice right there that, hey, better check your notums and make sure that runway is going to be open. Yeah, see the alert on the airport? We tap on that, view alert notice for that airport. That's a good point, Mike. Hey, there's a runway closed at, at your time of arrival. What if, is that dynamic? So if I change my time of departure to say, I'm going on the 4th of October or the no. 6th of October. It's that notum is active right now. It's in the, the database. So it finds it and it says, hey, heads up. That, yep, there's that a airport notum. has a notum, some sort of closure. Got it, okay. Excellent. Well, uh, that's a lot of the settings that I wanted to go over. Uh, at this point, let's go ahead and take a short break. We'll come back and uh, when we come back, we'll talk about setting up uh, the uh, a weight and balance. Will Michael talk us through that? And, uh, and then we'll talk about if there's time, we'll get into some more of what we left off last month on, uh, uh, on the, uh, the, the codes for filing. That, that's a very confusing thing. If there's time, we'll get into that. If not, we'll, we'll try and hit that next month. But uh, in any event, let's take a four minute break and we'll be back in, uh, in four minutes. So stretch your legs, do what you need to do, and we'll see you in a few minutes.
All right, welcome back. Hope you had a good break. We're going to pick up now with uh, Mike's going to talk to us about setting up a weight and balance. Um, Mike has done this and he does it really well. So I'm going to go ahead and he can do it better than I can. So let's go ahead and uh, Mike, if you're ready, I will stop sharing my screen. I am ready. And you okay. have the controls. Ooh, I have the aircraft. I uh, hope you like it. Uh, yeah, the weight and balance feature in ForeFlight to me is just amazing. It's one of the really great areas that, that it shines and makes a whole lot of things super simple. Um, and what I wanted to do is, is first, let's talk about how do you make up uh, an aircraft profile for weight and balance. And the first thing you need to know is there's really only two numbers you need out of your uh, aircraft. And uh, that is here. Let me share this screen, screen three. Um, this is the weight and balance information uh, sheet for my aircraft. And yeah, there's a lot of information on there. Most of that you don't need. Here's the only thing you need is down at the bottom, uh, this number uh, over on the left here, that is the empty weight of my aircraft. You can, uh, and this is the empty center of gravity, CG of my aircraft. Those are the only two pieces of information you need out of your airplane to get started. And uh, so I just want to touch on that for a moment. We'll come back to the iPad in just a moment. I'll show you how to set that up. But I wanted to introduce a couple of other interesting things. Your empty weight is more than my gross weight, Max. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I'm a wide body pilot. What can I say? Yeah. Well, on that <laughs> said, you probably burn that empty weight in fuel just taxiing to the runway at work. Uh, at work, yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> usually about a thousand pounds every. Oh, let me see. About every fifteen minutes, I go through a thousand pounds. Wow. Uh, so yeah, I had a forty-five minute taxi out of Tokyo last week, and we burned some fuel there. Wow. Um, but everything else you need to do flight planning in for flight is there's going to come from a bunch of different areas, and I see a lot of people trying to get that information out of their pilot operating handbook or the air aircraft flight manual or the uh, pilot's handbook, whatever it is. And I want to show you one example. Uh, this one is the entire weight and balance section out of a 1965 Mooney M20C that I was flying a little while back. That's it. There's no diagrams that you've only got a couple of numbers. And, and all it really says is your maximum takeoff weight is 2575. Uh, and max baggage weight is 120. But nowhere in this manual does it tell you what your center of gravity envelope is or what the arm of the seat or the baggage area is or fuel tank none of that's in there so now this is an older airplane uh, pushing 60 years old and we all know that those old documents for those old aircraft while it's a terrific airplane to fly a really fun good performer the manuals left a lot to be desired so uh and so in the more modern airplanes uh, what I see a lot of people doing is they'll reach into their POH or AFM supplement and they'll look at this chart, the center of gravity moment envelope chart, and they'll try to plug that into ForeFlight. And this is not the chart you need. Uh, it's only going to serve to confuse you. Uh, this happens to be one for a uh, turbo retractable 182 that I was flying a while ago. Uh, and this is the chart, though, that you want to use. This is the center of gravity limits chart. You can see it says it right down here. And this is your airplane CG in inches aft of datum. So that's what we really want to look at. And, and in particular here, it's a little bit hard to see, especially with these vertical lines. But you can see it's the forward CG limit down here. I know it's a little bit blurry there, but 1,800 pounds. The forward CG limit is 33 inches. It comes up here to about 2,250. It makes a little bend back here up to 2,700. And then it comes up here to a max takeoff weight of 3,100 pounds. So that's your forward limits. And then it goes straight back here to the aft limit is at 47 inches straight line all the way from 3,100 pounds all the way down to the bottom at, at uh, 1,800 pounds. So this is the envelope, the picture that we're going to draw within ForeFlight. But Again, these numbers are a little bit hard to see and to try to get those numbers off of where these corners are. It's a little bit tricky, maybe imprecise. Uh, your mileage may vary on your airplane. Maybe you don't have a, a very good description going on. So what I'm going to point you toward is another type of a document. 
Uh, this is a document called the Type Certificate Data Sheet, the TCDS. One of these is created for every aircraft that was ever made has a TCDS. And among the data in this TCDS is the weight and balance information. So here you can see we got our CG range. Uh, and now uh, this is going to, we're going to come back to this in a moment when we talk about Bob's airplane. Uh, earlier, Brian mentioned that Bob recently purchased a Bonanza F-33C. Uh, that's a particularly interesting one. And the reason that's in, important is sometimes an individual serial number or a, even a very small range of serial numbers will have particular differences for that aircraft. So you need to make sure you know your serial number of your aircraft and make sure you're getting the right data to start with. So in this particular case, if you have a serial number of 1 through 628, except for 975 and 1315, uh, these are the numbers you're going to use. And if you have those other ones, 975 or 31, uh, 1315, 1629 through 2041, these are the numbers you use. So somewhere over the, the production range of this aircraft, things changed. So you need to make certain you get the right ones. But notice this. Here we've got at 3,100 pounds, we've got our forward limits 40.9, our aft limits 47. At 2,700 pounds, 35.5 to 47. It, you notice it's always 47 at the aft limit. And down there at 2,250 or less, it's 33 inches to 47. So here you've got the exact number that we're going to program in flight in just a moment. So uh, in these later ones, you can see uh, the forward CG limits are the same, but the aft CG limits, they move the aft, the aft CG limit one inch forward for these particular aircraft. Uh, probably gives it a little bit more uh, controllability in the event of an aft CG limit or a, a necessary control endpoint. That doesn't really matter. But just make certain that you get your aircraft serial number when you look in the TCDS. So down here, we see some other numbers, empty weight, uh, CG range, there's no limit there, maximum weight, 3,100, okay, we know that. This is very handy. We've got the number of seats. There are four seats, two in the front that can move between 32 and 50, and two in the rear at 74 inches. So these numbers are very important, and these are what we're going to program into for flight in just a second. And we've also got a baggage area we can, with a total of 200 pounds, we can put 120 pounds between the 82 inch station and 110 and 80 pounds max between 110 and 134. Uh, and uh, fuel capacity uh, with this serial number range, we have standard tanks, we have long range tanks. So let's say this particular airplane that we're gonna do today has long range tanks. So we have 75 gallons usable. That's the number we care about because the other five gallons are not usable. So we're just gonna consider those are already added into the empty weight of the aircraft. We don't need to ever worry about it again. Uh, and we've got two 40 gallon tanks, uh, 37 and a half each, um, in the wings at station 48. So now we've got all the information we need to program this, uh, this weight and balance envelope. So I'm gonna switch over to four flight now. And this is going to take a moment because I have to switch to my iPad. It takes a moment. How are we doing, Brian? Any questions popping up? Um, I'm, I'm not monitoring the questions because I can't. It'll show up in the recording. Oh, so, oh right. <laughs> okay. So, not, yeah. Nothing specific regarding weight and balance. Okay, yet. great. Thanks. So uh, now this is, uh, I can't use that mouse anymore on this one. So I'll use my, oh, come on. Really? You're going to do this to me? Oh no, my USB mouse has decided to stop working here. All right, well, that's going to suck. Of course um, it did, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're having the technology issues. I just equipment, used a little... Equipment oh. knows when to mess with oh, us. Really here happens. we go. Now, now it's playing ball. Okay, so uh, this is the CG envelope, and you will probably recognize this as, is vaguely familiar from the one I showed you a moment ago with one difference. This is the CG envelope for my fixed gear non turboed 182 that other one we looked at was for a, a turbo retractable that belonged to one of my clients mm -hmm. and the only reason i didn't uh, give you a, a a different one was i didn't have the operating manual for my aircraft 
in uh, in a digital form. Um, but uh, actually, let me share one other thing first. Uh, let me get rid of these boxes here. This is the website, and if, uh, Bob or Brian, uh, can you grab that link and uh, put it in the chat here? This is pretty important right now. Yeah, I'll grab that. Okay. Um, so this is a link to the FAA's source of type certificate data sheets. It's a little bit cumbersome to try to find this, but if you want to look for a type certificate holder, you can type in the manufacturer name here. You just start typing and it says Cessna Aircraft Company. All right. So come over here to model and I have a 182 uh, C. It's, um, it, this is kind of an unwieldy website. I will absolutely agree with you. Uh, Textron now owns this uh, type certificate. So, uh, oops, not that one. I want the model number 182. Here we go. So I have a Cessna 182Q. So we can apply that and we're going to look down here is where you get the type certificate data sheet for my aircraft. So you can see here, this covers all of these models of 182 and it covers each of them individually. So item number one is a model 182 from 1956. That's an old airplane for you. But you scroll down here a little bit and eventually we're gonna get to uh, the L. Just scroll down here and we'll find those numbers that we're looking for. So here's the 182P, mine's a Q, it starts right here. Tells you what kind of engine you can put in, what kind of fuel, uh, propeller, all these things are in that type certificate data sheet. So here's where we got this, the uh, center of gravity information. It starts on one page and goes to the next, so it's kind of a pain. Um, but this is how you find that data. Now, go back over here to ForeFlight and we'll uh, do this thing again. Do, 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 do. Is it going to play? There we go. All right. So you will notice down here at the bottom, we've got an edit button. I, I, but first of all, if you don't see weight and balance down here in a tab, you can tap more and you'll see weight and balance over here on the right hand side. Once we've used it, it will put this the last used more category, I guess you'd say, will be the button on the right hand side over here. So we can click over here to the maps. We want to get back to weight and balance easily. We just click over here. So this is my aircraft and we've got a load and we've got a setup. So I'm going to look at the setup right now and you see, okay, I've got my tail number. I've got the serial number. I'm going to use inches. I'm going to use pounds. I don't want to use percent of Mac. That's a percent of mean aerodynamic cord. That's something that's used on big airplanes, swept wing jets, that sort of thing. Uh, our fuel is going to be in gallons. It's Hunter low lead. That's how much it weighs. These are the stations. You remember I showed you in that TCDS a moment ago that it said we got the front seats are between this number and that number. Well, I just split that number in the middle and uh, used 41 inches. The ass seats are at 74 inches. Baggage area A with a limit of 120 pounds at 95 inches. And remember the, the values we got out of the type certificate data sheet were a range of numbers. So I just placed it in the middle and figure my baggage is going to be probably somewhere toward the middle of that range. Uh, and then fuel tanks, 75 gallons at 48 inches. Now, continuing down here, this is the empty weight in CG. So these are those two numbers I showed you on that first form. This is what you need to get out of your aircraft for your individual aircraft. So you just plug those in here. And the way you do that, of course, is you tap the edit button and you can uh, edit all these values. You can rearrange them if you wanted to put your F seats in front of the forward seats. So I don't know, fly backwards. But you can put these in an order that makes sense for you. Uh, down here, of course, where you enter your numbers, we got our uh, weight limits, our maximum ramp weight, max takeoff weight, and landing weight, and zero fuel weight. And I, I know I'm going to get some questions. Hey, I have a Cessna 182Q, and that's got a max landing weight of 2950. What's up with that? I have an extra supplemental type certificate, an STC, that allows me to take off a little heavier in my airplane. So I've got a max landing limit shows up here, 
and I got this little top hat kind of section on my weight and balance envelope. So once I've entered all these values, I can click done. And this is the, the basic information I need for the aircraft as a whole. Now when I'm going to take a flight, I'm going to click over here and load. And I'm going to define how much weight is at each station. So I'm weighing in at about a buck 90 right now. My wife's 115. Uh, my friend Karen is at 150. Uh, and then I have just a pilot and co-pilot. And personally, I find it easier to use a separate load for each seat rather than uh, one load that's for the front seats and another for the back seats. I just find it a little easier that way. Uh, I could corner somebody and get the weight more privately, and then I don't have to do the mental math. I don't have to add these up. I can just add this person or remove this person. So the way I have it set up, I'm always in the front seat there. If I put my wife in the back seat there and uh, I've got a 195 pounder in one back seat and another 195, 115 pounder in the other back seat. Um, that's how easy it is to add weights. And notice every time I click that, uh, oops, every time I selected this, uh, it instantly changes the location of my weight and balance calculation over here. Uh, if you uh, have every time I click on myself and add it to my weight and balance, the four flight dings. Yeah, I've noticed <laughs> that too. Uh, and I can probably make that happen here. Let's see if I put that one up there here. I'll, I'll put three of us in the front seat. Yeah, that ding. Yeah, that I, ding. I, don't, I don't know what that's all about. I yeah. wish it would stop though. Right. Do you know why I'm just a bonus question? Why most weight and balances have that angled cutoff on them? Uh, this one on the aft or this no, one the on forward. the There's always a corner cut off at the forward heavy weights. Yeah, and I think this is because, remember, this has to do with the controllability of the aircraft. You have the, that elevator back there is at a certain arm. And if you, as your aircraft gets heavier, you the range of control that you have is reduced. So the envelope gets narrower the heavier you are. Yeah, bonus material, and it's not on the test. But yeah, elevator authority for landing, so you can yep. flare. That's what it's all about. And then the aft limit is elevator authority for a stall recovery and spin avoidance. Right. So in this particular case with this STC that I have on my aircraft, they move that aft limit forward by about two inches. So if I'm over 2950, I have a more restrictive envelope. And those of you who fly our model and later 182s with a maximum takeoff weight of 3100 this is your aft limit all the way down so i kind of have the best of all worlds here so a couple other things i want to point out um, if you have a load that you carry on a regular basis uh, if you have an e-bike for instance i don't have to add up separately all the stuff that's going in my aft baggage if i'm going to bring this e-bike with me i can just click that and the e-bike is there so I can make sure that I've, I've got the load capacity to accommodate it. Uh, similarly, uh, a lot of people fly in a 182. If I take everything off of here, if it's me solo and we don't have that bike, and actually, uh, let me put another pretty heavy co-pilot over here at, uh, let's say, 240. Uh, and if I click Save Now, uh, so it's the two of us up front. That's a pretty far forward CG. And uh, those of you familiar with 182s will know that uh, they typically have a pretty heavy nose on landing. So they like to carry a little bit of ballast in the back seat. So if you put a five gallon water bottle back there, you can see it moves the CG just a little bit farther back and might give you a little bit better controllability on landing. So over here is your audit of it. Uh, your your uh, maximum ramp weight is 3110. I actually weigh 2658. Uh, so I'm good there. Everything's good on this one, so it's green. Uh, I will point out one of my wish lists is that I wish it would tell me how much more space I have. So I'm, whatever this is, 442 pounds below my max ramp weight. Here's my takeoff weight and CG. Here's my landing weight and CG. And here's my zero fuel. Uh, and speaking of this landing, by the way, you'll see this little circle on the top. That's our takeoff weight. The square toward the bottom is were our landing weight based on how much fuel I told it I was going to burn on this flight. And unfortunately, it doesn't take this value from the flight plan that we planned over here on maps. Uh, it would be really nice if it came over here, but 
uh, this flight that I'm, I'm working with right now, I'm going to burn 195 gallons and obviously I can't do that. So what you have to do instead while you're in this load uh, section, you tap in the fuel section here, it'll say, all right, we've got a fuel tank here, we've got 75 gallons of fuel, and we're going to burn 60 gallons of fuel. So if let's say I'm doing a flight that I'm going to instead burn 45 gallons of fuel, we can do the calculation for that instead. I think it's important to remember that this is just a standalone calculator. Basically, yes. It's an instantaneous uh, graphical 2D calculator. Uh, what I want to point out, though, is this diamond here is your zero fuel. So if for some reason you're overburning and you burn more fuel than you planned on burning on your flight, eventually when you have to dead stick land two miles short of the airport because you things happened and you didn't make it, uh, this is where your CG is. So you, you know you're going to be okay. Mike, um, I've got a bunch of people uh, posting questions about how you got your updated uh, uh, weight for your aircraft, your basic empty weight. Uh, okay, the, the basic empty weight information comes out of the weight and balance sheet that should be in your aircraft. It's one of the mandatory things you have to carry with you when you fly is the weight and balance. That's the number they want. They don't care about your calculation for this particular flight, but you need to have your empty weight and CG and that's for your aircraft in your POH, normally in the POH. Um, and anytime you get equipment added and or removed from your aircraft, your mechanic who does that work should provide you with an updated weight and balance sheet. Uh, ours is the result of almost 50 years of being updated. Uh, probably bears little resemblance to reality. So one of the, these days soon, we're going to reweigh our aircraft and get a good number to start with. So hopefully that answers that one. You got another quick one, James? Um, we do have a question. Some, a couple of people pointed out that their weight and balance screen uh, looks different uh, than <laughs> this one here. Sure. Uh, every aircraft is going to have its own uh, envelope depiction. Uh, the discussion on the four flight users group on uh, uh, on Facebook just the other day, a, a gentleman was trying to program in their envelope and they were using those moment numbers that that graph that looks kind of slanted over to the side. They weren't using the CG envelope. So that's why I say you should get these numbers out of the TCDS and you'll you should end up with a box that looks something like this and your aircraft is going to be different than mine. Even the TR-182 is a slightly different envelope than the fixed gear, normally aspirated 182. You might want to show the setup screen. I think that's what people are wanting. Mm -hmm. that, that's the answer to the question because you want yeah. to show, okay, where are these points? So uh, continuing on down here, we, we talked about the fuel. We, we talked about the stations. This is a station is a place on the aircraft that you can put a weight. So we got front seats. We got back seats. We got forward baggage. We got aft baggage. I fly a 310 a lot. We have... Uh, nacelle baggage, we have aux tanks, we have main tanks, we've got all sorts of stuff. So you make a station for each one. Uh, and now uh, we, we set up our limits here. So this is again your max ramp weight, your max taxi weight, your max landing weight. Uh, some airplanes have a, a zero maximum zero fuel weight. Most of our little airplanes do not, so this should say none. Uh, if you uh, have a number in there and you're getting a, a warning about that you've exceeded your max zero fuel weight, it's probably because you put something like 2,000 pounds in there, so you're over that number. A lot of people will even put their takeoff weight in there. Well, uh, so if you're over that, you get over max takeoff weight and over max zero fuel weight. But most aircraft don't start getting into a maximum zero fuel weight until you get into heavier piston twins at least. Uh, some a lot of turbine aircraft will have a max zero fuel weight our little airplanes single engine airplanes it's not an issue now remember that we talked about those forward limits i showed you those those values out of the tcds this is where you program them in so at 3100 our forward limit is 41 inches our aft limit is 46 inches at 2950 it's 39.5 versus 46 and then i had to kind of sneak mine because uh, I have this little top hat thing here, and I can't have two aft limits at the same weight, so I had to, to fake it out, and I had to tell it this is the aft limit at 2951, 
So if I'm over max landing weight, this is my aft limit. And then I put another one uh, at the, the actual, the, the 48.5 at 29.50. So if you fly a P or a Q model 182, this is the number that you should have in yours uh, for your aft limit. Uh, and then we've got a 33 inch corner at 2,250 pounds. There's no, uh, that, that's this little corner right here. There's no change at the aft limit at that weight. So I just left that one blank. And then I set a lower limit at 2,000 pounds, uh, 33 inches, uh, forward limit 33, aft limit 48. And my empty weight, again, was uh, 1,800 and change. I figure, okay, the airplane's 1,808. I'm 190, so that's just about 2,000 pounds. I'm always going to have some fuel on board, so I would never be below 2,000 pounds. I don't need to go any lower than that for these numbers. So I think these... just to, to quell some confusion, I, I just want to say you're plotting the corners of that graph. You're, you're basically yes. telling it where each point is, and yes. each point is defined by inches and pounds. Yes. And so basically you're plotting uh, weight by CG all the way around, and that's what all those different points are. And I think some people are having a little trouble with that. Uh, also, others are seeing a different format. Maybe they've got their iPad rotated vertically, or maybe it's on a mini. It might be different. So that's rotated. Yeah, that's some people little... are only seeing two columns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you can go horizontal so, and three. And if you're using a smaller screen, you might not have quite as much information here. So right. uh, you know these numbers. You're absolutely right. We are numerically defining this polygon, basically. Uh, can you tell I dropped out of college math by just uh, dropping the points, plotting? So the points. yeah, at this. Uh, weight here, it has calculated that I weigh 2648. So at that weight, the limit is 36.7 to 48.5. So it's doing the math based on this weight. It knows where that point is, and it knows where that point is. Those are the numbers right here, and I'm at 38.8. It says I am between those numbers. All life is a sunny day, and things are good. Uh, similarly, it does the same thing at landing and the same thing at zero fuel. So uh, setting up these loads over here, what I did was I go over to the load and I click edit so I can add a new load. So let's say um, let's say a load that I often bring is a, a raft. Toolbox. Oh, uh, raft. I thought you're going to go. Across OK, a raft. That's a good one. How much does this raft weigh, Brian? Some of them are pretty heavy. I'd say 85 pounds. OK, so let's say 85 pounds. All right. So now. And once I'm done editing this, now if I have the raft installed, I just click it. So if I got my bike and my raft, I'm going over to Catalina. I'm going to put them both. And of course, it doesn't like that because I've told it that both of these are in baggage area A, which baggage area A is limited to 120 pounds, and I've got 131 pounds there. So I have to define that load instead for baggage B and put it back there. But <laughs> it's not going to like that because B is limited to 80 pounds, so I can't even put the raft on the aft half of this baggage area. I'd have to put it in the forward half, load my bike in the back half. So what I really like about this is you can play with these numbers. So whenever I'm taking a new pilot and teaching him how to work his airplane, we'll look at this and say, okay, if it's me and a 320 pounder and there's nothing else on board the aircraft other than fuel, I am right on that forward CG limit. So that's how much it takes to get me right on the limit. Anything over that, I have to go break out the calculator and, and do the math. So I can take a pretty big person in the front and not have a problem. So what about aft? If it's only me and I have only, I, I have a full 120 pounds in baggage A and I got, uh, let's say 80 pounds in baggage B, okay? That's where my CG is. So basically, there is no way for me to get my aircraft anywhere near the aft CG limit. So I have to really break some rules to make this work. So what if I take this aft baggage back here? Let's say I put 400 pounds back there. Okay, well, it doesn't like that. But you see, it's drawing the envelope. I'm mostly out of balance is the problem because I'm after my aft CG limit. I'm within my, my uh, weight limit. So I kind of encourage you to do some experimenting with this and just see what it takes to get your airplane out of service, out of range. 
So the last thing I want to show you is an aircraft a little bit like um, like a Bob's that we were talking about a little while ago. He got a Beechcraft. Where did I go? An F-33A. This is not the F-33C that he's got. But notice this one. Uh, at takeoff, our CG is fine. But as we burn fuel, that CG moves aft. And the reason for that is the fuel tanks are in the very forward part of the wing, forward of the forward wing spar. So they're well ahead of the empty CG. And as that fuel is burned and it gets lighter, the CG of the whole aircraft moves back. So I know when I was a new pilot, in fact, 44 years ago today, I earned my private pilot license. <laughs> so way back then, we never did a landing CG calculation or a, a zero fuel a CG calculation. So I would never have known that this was a problem. Oh, congratulations. And, 44 years. That's significant. I, I, where did all that time go? I don't get right. it. <laughs> You're getting close to that master award. Uh, almost. Right, brothers. S yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is an aircraft. Now we've got four people in it. We got 100 pounds of baggage. We're within weight, but this is not going to work because shortly after takeoff, we're going to burn aft of our aft CG limit. So I encourage you to use this tool to these extents and figure out where your your problem areas are basically very cool i'd like to i know we're running long tonight and some people are wondering how long this is so what i know it's what we do we just got so much great <laughs> stuff to offer um we will uh, i think what i'd like to do maybe is end the recording the rec wings recording part of this maybe we'll give the awards but we can hang out some more and answer some questions you want to do that or did you you want to you got a little more to go here um, that's off. really about all for here. Uh, what I just to point out that again over here when you're putting your in-flight consumption, you have to remember to manually enter that number uh, because it doesn't transfer from your flight plan. Very uh, and tip. other and I know than that, uh, Bob's also got his uh, weight and balance to show us. But what I'd like to do is announce the winners, so I know people are hanging in just for that. Okay, and then I'll stop the share, and you can take the aircraft back. If we do that, then. Uh, I can move on and people can who are just hanging out to see if they won all these fantastic prizes then um, i hope i won all right give me just a second to reconfigure this time's up yeah give me more than that <laughs> <laughs> well bob do you want i tell you what let me just announce the winners here right, uh setting something up while you're doing that okay go ahead just gold seal one alejandro justo uh congratulations uh We'll, I'll send you an email on how to collect that. You can do the private or the instrument for the Gold Seal class. My son just did the instrument course, and it's a great program. And I'm told uh, they're going to have commercial in the spring. Yeah, he's working on that. It's a great program. The illustrations are videos. I mean, if you'd rather read a book or just keep reading something, that's one thing. But a picture is worth a thousand word of, words. A video is worth a million. And, and, and Russ Still and the, the group at Gold Seal have put together some fantastic uh, visual presentations. Uh, if you're a better visual learner, that, that I rec recommend their program. The second one goes to Gabriel Pataki. Congratulations. We'll send you an email to your uh, email address you registered with. The uh, one year NAFI membership goes to uh, Margie Leggett. Congratulations on that. And the ultimate pilot logbook goes to Scott Snyder. Scott, congratulations. All of you, the five of you will, or one, two, three, four of you, will send you email uh, and tell you how to collect those. Next month, I'm gonna, I've just been busy flying and, and I, I'm a bit remiss on getting some really better prizes. So I just need to reach out uh, over the next month and hopefully we'll have some really, really cool ones. I'm hoping for some headsets as well. So congratulations to those winners. And um, <clears throat> let me see if I can, uh, we will reach out to you as well. Uh, Bob, you wanna go ahead and share now your, uh, yep. Weight and balance. Working on it right now. Okay. Um, and I'm going to, let's see if I can get back to my. I'm actually just going to point one other thing. Uh, some people noted that uh, their screens are different. Um, if you are looking for this enhanced version, uh, if you go to account settings uh, for flight labs and then enable the enhanced weight and balance um, setting, that's where uh, you'll see these extra. Um, um, items that are available for performance plus customers. Ah, okay. Um, I guess uh, we all just enabled it by default and forgot we put that on there. Yeah, that's in, yeah under the settings, and I can show that later as well. Um, I'm trying to uh, Bob, don't start yet. I'm trying to, for the recording sake, get you over to another screen here. I am so okay. Sorry. All yours. Okay. 
Um, am I okay to share? Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. So here's here's my aircraft. I have an F-33. I've just recently purchased an F-33C Bonanza. Uh, there's only 10 of them left in the United States, oh, by the way. Um, it is a all utility category with an aerobatic limit down in here. Yes, it's an aerobatic airplane. Um, and this envelope is a little difficult, as Mike pointed out, to read. So what I did was, just like Mike stated, I went out to the TCDS for the airplane. So utility category, Max Gross, F-33A, F-33C, 3,400, and aerobatic category is 2,800 pounds. However, I have to remove two seats to do that. And the problem is, is that we've never weighed the airplane with that. So we don't know what that is. So the airplane only has a weight and balance for the four seat arrangement. So I've never, I've deliberately not set up the aerobatic in mine uh, just to be sure that I'm not tempted to do something incredibly stupid. Okay. So you can see how narrow the aerobatic envelope is for my airplane. So having said that, in four flight, the same thing. And, and Mike kind of kind of stole what I was going to talk about. And I'm, I'm not mad at you, Mike. I'm just I was hoping to do it. But anyway, here profile name. I went out and got the default for the F-33C from um uh from uh, four flight loaded that in, and then I put in our, my information for the airplane. Its empty CG is 81.46 inches. Basic empty weight is 2276. These are the stations that I grabbed for it. And down here, oops, wrong thing. Then I plugged in the envelope. So the forward CG at um, 3,400 pounds, max gross is 82.1. At 2,800 pounds, it's 77 inches, and a 2,276, it's basic empty weight, 77 inches again. The aft, straight line down in the back, 2,276, at, at, or 86.7 inches, both at uh, empty and 3,400 pounds. And of course, if it had an oddball envelope like uh, Mike was showing, um, it would, we would be able to put that in. So you can see what, what the envelope looks like. That's pretty plain Jane. What's really important here is, as Mike pointed out, if it's two, it's two people. You know, I weigh 238 nowadays. That's the good news. Uh, and a 170 pound passenger. And uh, I put my flight bag in the back. That's 10 pounds. Um, okay, that's fine. The back seat tail compartment. Uh, because it's a pretty airplane, I bought a whole bunch of covers for it. That's 25 pounds of canvas I'm hauling around with me all the time. Okay, fuel tanks, all that other good stuff. And then fuel to destination, 22, pound, 22 gallons. Okay, that's fine. Now let's change it up. And I'm not going to go quite as extreme as Mike did. I'm going to put another 200 pounder in the back. Wow, we're starting to get close here. Okay. If, we zoom in, if I zoom in on that, if I run out of gas, I'm starting to get towards the aft limit. All right, so I'm going to put in a, oops, I keep clicking the wrong thing. I keep clicking the screen. I'm going to put in my neighbor's wife, and I'm going to put her in the airplane and call her 140, because she's a little girl. Okay. Well, I'm outside the envelope at the top. Okay, I'm over gross. And I go all the way through. So, okay, let's take away some of the fuel. And let's go with, uh, well, I'll go with 45 gallons of fuel. Well, I can sure take off, but I can only fly for about 10 minutes. If you all can see that. So really, 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 you know, depending on your airplane, Beechcraft are notorious for this. The uh, center of gravity moves all over the place, and they've got no. I've got no place to put weight in the front to try to try to make that work, unless I go out and gain the forty pounds that I've lost, and I really don't want to do that. So be careful with this. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out 
is Mike's, oops, Mike said that there isn't a way of seeing um, what you have. However, if you go into, I did a notional flight from uh, Creveport Airport up to Waukegan. And if I go down here, and I just had one person myself, I did it real fast. So the weight and balance, fuel policy, flight fuel, takes 24 gallons, it's assuming 12 pounds to go, uh, fuel destination 22, fuel and landing. If you look down here, you'll see I've got 919 pounds of it left at zero fuel. Uh, ramp weight, I've got 487 pounds and takeoff weight, 487 pounds. So be aware of that. Also, if your airplane has landing weight um, restrictions, Probably not something you're going to encounter in too many light aircraft, but if you're flying something esoteric, I don't know, uh, Mike or or Brian, would a Pilatus have this issue? Um, it's possible. I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with it, but it's, yeah, it's, sure. it's certainly 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 the equipment you guys fly in in your professional careers have landing weight restrictions. Yeah, a lot of larger aircraft have landing weight limits for sure. Because the we need to be below a certain weight in order to land. So we take off overweight and we need to burn down certain fuel before we can land. Right. Because because the gear can't take take a hard take a, a bad landing. Correct. So that's one of my landings. <laughs> Here's, I've, I think I've flown with flown with you in the front. I think you're all right. <laughs> anyway, so um I just wanted to point that out. It, it, the, the reason I wanted to go through it for my airplane is that it is very, very weight and balance sensitive. For my wife and myself, it's a perfect airplane. If we want to take our neighbors flying, we really got to think carefully about what we're going to do. So, food for thought. All right, very cool. Yeah, all the documents we've referred to, the recording, the I, that someone mentioned they'd love to see the chat. There was a lot of really good stuff in the chat. I am going to publish the chat, and I'll put it on this website, fourflightworkshops.com. Uh, we'll have the chat on there. Uh, I might even put a Q and A to answer some more. We'll, we'll try and answer some more of the questions that were going on that we didn't get to in here as well. Also, I, I just want to show that in the, uh, uh, go to the iPad real quick. Some of you said you had a different view and I, I noticed that Bob even had it as well. James had mentioned it. If you, if you have a different weight and balance, you have the enhanced weight and balance turned off, go to more and then go to account. And then all the way down at the bottom, you'll see four flight labs. This is some cutting edge stuff. And that's where the advanced enhanced weight and balance is right here. And you want to turn that on. Yours may be turned on or off. Uh, if it looks different, that may be why right there. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Um, yeah. And I, I want to note that I use the standard one. I went right. to the enhanced for a while and I found I did not like it. I, I like the uh, standard one better. Same here. I agree. I had the, the same thing. Uh, we'll post some of that on the four flight workshops. If I announced your winner, we'll sit, we'll reach out to you as well. The, if you're watching this recording, this is only for the recording. If people are watching it on YouTube, uh, please feel free to scan this. You'll take a quiz for wings credit. If you're on here live right now, you're automatically going to get wings credit. There's also a link in the description below for the wings credit. You can click on that. If you're going to use the same device and scanning as possible. One last thing next uh, or later this month, uh, we're going to be in uh, Lakeland, Florida, giving a lot of presentations. Uh, come on down if you're a flight instructor. We've got a lot of seminars. Uh, you get a lot of networking going on at the uh, NAFI first annual summit for flight instructors uh, in Lakeland on October 24th through 26th. The website is NAFI summit 2023.org. Come down and join us if you're anywhere in the area. Uh, and Brian Schiff will be one of the speakers. Uh, I am. We've got a great bunch of speakers coming to, to that. Uh, John and Martha King will be uh, dinner speakers. It's just, it'll be a great, great opportunity to meet a lot of great people in the industry. Yeah, uh, come down and, and come see us. I really appreciate that, Bob. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us. We'll see you next month. Thank you very much for joining us.